Okay, we're recording. Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audio-visual channel. My name is Gabriella Handel, I'm a draftsman and your host for this podcast, A Conversation About Art. With these conversations, I'm doing long-term research on the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I bring you episode 107 with artist Ku Skadler. If you enjoy- What? It's Shadler, S-C-H. Shadler. Shadler, okay. If you enjoy this video, please like and share all the videos and subscribe because these actions are very helpful. You can help even further by checking out the links in the description. Ku, welcome to A Conversation About Art. Again, you are episode 107. Please tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. Well, thanks for inviting me. I love to share um, art generally and specifically what I do. I work primarily in two lesser known mediums. One is egg tempera, okay. in which you uh, make paint from scratch using egg yolk as the binder. And the other one is metal point, where you draw with different uh, nibs of metal, often silver, but sometimes gold or brass or things like that. And I do a lot of combining of those mediums as well. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a metal point drawing with some egg tempera on it and then maybe a gold leaf area as well. So I love the traditional arts. I love craft. I love combining them. And that's what I do for myself in the studio. And I also teach quite a bit um, because these are uh, traditional arts that not a lot of people know. And the audience is small, but very devoted to wanting to learn these arts. So I do teach workshops. That's primarily what I do. Okay. Why do you think there's uh, and, um, I mean, I guess I wonder if you also feel this way, like kind of this this loyalty sort of to to the egg tempera or the silver point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and do you feel that way? Absolutely. And it's inexplicable because I became an artist. I started kind of late. I was in my 30s and I hadn't decided what I was going to do with my life. I'd spent a lot of time traveling and just being a little gypsy wandering around the world. But I'd always loved art, I loved traditional art, and I took a history of painting class at the College of Marin in which the teacher, Chester Arnold, taught a tempera. Mm -hmm. And we had one three-hour class in making gesso, which was fascinating. And then we had one three-hour class where we just got to paint in a tempera. So it wasn't a lot of introduction or teaching. Chester kind of just let us do our thing. Um, But, you know, he came and he stood behind me and he looked over my shoulder and he said, you're going to be an egg temper painter. And I had no idea what he meant, mm-hmm. but he recognized my affinity for it immediately. And he was right. <laughs> I spent the next three years going back between, uh, I was studying classical oil painting with Shirley and Numael Polito. And then I'd go back to my studio and do egg tempera. And I just, the call was there and I couldn't resist it. Um, so eventually I selected that. And then when I tried metal point, which is very similar, Uh, They're both linear mediums. The Mm -hmm. thing that really captivates me is they're both mediums where you have to accumulate layer after layer after layer. It's this meditative, atmospheric, holographic kind of effect where you gradually build towards something. And yeah, they speak to my nature. Anybody who knows me knows they suit my nature. And um, so, yeah, there's some strange loyalty that happens in in our nature, in the nature of the medium, and when the two meet, if you're fortunate enough to have that happen, you fall in love. And mm-hmm. that love is what keeps you as an artist. Okay, and what, what nature is that? Um, uh, what does that mean? Well I, well, I think we're all born with a, a nature. You know, Some of us are extroverts, introverts, um, linear, painterly, uh, wanna work a la prima, all in one, crazy inspired dash expressionistic with our emotions others want to work you know gradually and build up layers over days or months or weeks and i i don't know how to explain that nature but we have it and as a teacher i've been teaching for you know 20 plus years maybe 25 i can't i'm not quite sure i've had thousand you know over a thousand students and i i recognize it immediately Mm -hmm. i know the person who's gonna add cadmium orange spilled all over their clothes and all over the floor and painting an inch thick in egg temper, which you cannot do. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the workshop, I say, mm, you might wanna consider oil painting. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. And then I recognize the person 
whose brushes are all laid out orderly and they cut their little piece of paper to wipe the brush with all the same size and I'm not that fussy but when I see that person I said oh you're going to be an egg temper painter mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we are born with certain natures and mediums have certain natures sure which isn't to say that you can't push those natures which is what I do with egg tempera I tend to push it more into the oil realm in a way I want to get uh, a more uh, traditional light effect, deeper darks, more smooth blending. So I take it a little bit out of the linear realm that it is best suited to um, and push its nature, but ultimately I have to be true to it. it. It just won't do certain things. So that's what I mean about, I think we, and I don't know what other word to use, to, but nature, we arrive with certain natures and mm -hmm. mediums have more or less certain natures. And as I said, when when you're fortunate enough to have those come together, that's really what makes a painter. And you should be true to that. And it's, for instance, in a temper, it can be hard to be true to that because it's laborious, it's slow, it's not well known, the galleries don't understand it. It's in some ways um, a fragile medium. There are drawbacks to being an a temper painter. But if you fight that, you're you're never gonna enjoy your medium you know you're not gonna have that kind of love affair with it mm -hmm. that keeps you in the game when it gets hard so you know for your own work you seem to exemplify that really well is that you were drawn to a certain kind of draftsmanship and that's what you do you know and so that's what I mean by it mm -hmm. so it's kind of I mean based on your on the like analogous comparison of of the person that has paint on their on their apron and stuff versus yeah. somebody that's being like really orderly so yeah. so I mean if you're if, if you're gonna work in layers as I understand egg tempera to be and also mm -hmm. um, the silver point yeah I mean that requires a certain kind of organizational sort of thinking because it's like you obviously can't go darkest first <laughs> right so yes um, so then, all right, so then that definitely requires, or, you know, it makes sense that it would require at least the capacity to have some kind of organizational thinking of like, all right, I, I obviously can't do that now. I have to start this way and kind of do it slow, carefully, patiently, this type of stuff. So, so I mean, is, is that accurate? I mean, would you, would you say that it's kind of like a personality uh, as well as being maybe a, the nature of the person? I think you could use those words kind of interchangeably. And you're right, you're right on, you're understanding this. And of course, you know, life is often a bell curve where there's always people on the extreme. So you will find people using egg temper. We don't obviously don't all work the same. And you will find people treating it like watercolor or treating it like oil more. And to some extent, when I see somebody painting an egg temper like watercolor, I say, um, maybe just do watercolor because you right. don't have to make the paint stretch. Right. So, but you'll still find people, no, I love egg temper and I treat it like watercolor and fine I don't mess with people's uh, the thing that calls them their working method their love because you have to have that you know that connection that love to be a painter so you'll find people on the extremes but most people who work in egg tempera end up being layer painters layered painters as you're saying mm -hmm. and you're right it's a fascinating thing that is very frustrating to beginners because it is like paint, playing a chess game you know how a good chess player is always playing eight moves ahead. Mm -hmm. And to some degree in a tempera, you start to do that too. You start to understand this, well, I'm here at layer 20 and I'm not where I wanna be, but I will be when I get to layer 30. And what I often tell students when they're learning is they'll say, I, I, I'm not there. I, I can't work in this medium, I'm making mistakes. And I say, no, imagine this, you're going from New Hampshire, where I live, to California. Mm -hmm. And you're in Ohio. <laughs> Ohio doesn't look like San Francisco, yeah, yeah. but it's the right direction. And mm -hmm. I say, if you're in Key West, I'll let you know. I'll let yeah. you know that you are not layering properly, mm -hmm. but you're fine. It's just, you just need more layers and you need experience to know how you're gonna get to those darker lights. Right. You have to get comfortable with understanding that it's not gonna happen until layer 30 or 40 or 60. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I um, I like, I mean, my medium is graphite, graphite on paper. I like drawing yep. quite a lot. 
And, um, you know, of course, each medium has its own limitations, but I yeah. don't care for working very much with the really hard pencils like the H's. Yeah. Um, I prefer, you know, to be something a little softer like that. And then I make a whole drawing with the one pencil. <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, I, I, don't, I have no problem in terms of kind of reaching the spectrum of tone that I want, like no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, with those yep. kind of middle pencils, but then it's like when I when when I see um, a silver point drawing, and I haven't seen that many. I'm not really that familiar mm -hmm. with the medium. Yep. But uh, it seems to ha like the spectrum is really narrow mm -hmm. in terms of tone. I mean, I mean, would you mind elaborating on that? It's like how oh, like for, yeah. because for example, you were talking about how you kind of like uh, like stretch the egg tempera and kind of like it's, yeah, yeah. it's capacity. So like, how, do, how do you stretch the capacities of silver point? Oh, uh, this is such an interesting topic. Um, well, there's many ways to do it. There are metal point artists. I always say metal point, silver point. You're right. That's the more common term that people use. Um, and it's a fine term to use because silver is the primary nib that people use. Oh, but metal but includes like the, the other metals, I guess, right? Right, because there's That's silver, right. there's gold, and which other? Lead also? I mean, I don't know. What, what, oh, metals, what metals are, are used? There, there's brass, there's copper. Ah, uh, all there's of them, okay. Lead, there's tin. Yeah, Anything, okay. this is, gets kind of technical, but this is what I love. There's something called the Mohs hardness scale, which rates the hardness of a metal or the softness of a metal. Mm. And it goes from number, and zero is talc, and 10 is diamond. Okay. And it has steps in between of hardness. And if you have a piece of metal whose most hardness rating is four or less, you're going to pretty readily get a mark. Okay. Now, there are people who like to push the medium and try to work with harder metals. But generally, so this includes, as I said, brass, copper, gold, silver, lead. So there's, there's quite a few metals you can use. And that's why I prefer to call it metal point. Right, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but many people use silver and it's it's preferred for several reasons, complicated reasons. But back to your original question, you're right in that generally the medium has a limited tonal range. Right. But there's always, like I push egg tempera, there's always those of us who wanna push metal point sure. and try to deepen the darks. And there's many ways to do that, including uh, increasing the abrasion of the surface you're working on by adding different fillers like silica, which is very hard and abrasive, okay. kind of making more of a sandpaper drawing surface mm -hmm. that removes more metal to increase the darkness. It, it's more complicated than I'm saying, but that's you know one way to think about it. You could also add additives to the ground that make the metal tarnish and that can darken it. You uh -huh. can work mixed media, which is what I do. And, um, you know, I like to add ink or, uh, you know, uh, graphite, like a 2B, like you say. Mm -hmm. So there's ways to push the medium. Um, and then there's lots of people who actually like that limited tonal range. We're back yeah. to that thing of what speaks to you. Uh, but I do, like you, I like that dramatic tonal range and I push it to get it in metal point for sure. Mm. So then when you're layering, in your case, well, you because didn't you say that you layer the egg tempera with the metal point or you said you make a section with egg tempera and another section a different section with the metal point because i mean you can't put them on top of each other or you can it's uh, <laughs> these are the kind of games i like to play this is you know i'm i'm part artist and part kind of mad scientist in the studio mm -hmm. i love materials and working methods i love for example all the different um, fillers that you could add to change a metal point drawing surface. Mm -hmm. Silica, talc, mm -hmm. gypsum, feldspar. I mean, so I'm a little bit of a mad scientist in the studio as well as, you know, an expressive artist. Um, so what was your question? I got distracted by that. Um, um, I was wondering how you layer the egg tempera with the silver point. Okay, yeah, this is a great question. Um, you can, as you say, do different sections of a drawing and add color to it. Uh, you could just add a little color at the end. But what I like to do is put a very thin layer of white over a drawing. Um, it's called a scumble, one of the words for it. There's different meanings for the word scumble. But one is a thin layer of transparent white, kind of like an oxymoron. 
And the way to think of it is think of atmospheric perspective. So when you look in the distance on a foggy day, the hills turn this slightly lighter value, cooler blue tone. That's mm -hmm. what a scumble will do in nature. And that's what it does in a drawing. And it softens a metal point drawing. It kind of unifies things because they're all under this shared veil of white. It's a way to reinstate abrasion. If you have worked a metal point ground and gotten it kind of too smooth so it's not wearing down that metal nib, it's a way to kind of stick in new particles that can abrade the nib. But you have to do it very, very thin because if it's too thick, you just lose the drawing. You have to think of it like a thin mist of white. And then you can go back and start drawing on top of it again. So these are kind of the fun games I love to play. But as I said, they, they complicate, I complicate these mediums. And it's by joy, I find it fun and interesting. Hmm, what's gonna happen if I do this? But it also makes me a slow artist. I don't produce a lot of work and, you know, and I've questioned that at times. Like, I think we sure. all at times get frustrated by our choices, but, and it's good to, if, you're frust if your choices frustrate you, it's definitely good to try other options. But sometimes we just end up going right back to what we're doing because we love it. Mm. You know, there's something magical about it. And the way I work just happens to call me to work in a layered, <laughs> laborious sometimes manner. I get lost in the process. And when I'm lost in it, we all know the joy of being lost in our process. Mine, though, can be a long process. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it take a while. So when you add like silica and talc and these things that you were that you were saying mm -hmm. for the metal point drawing in order to get a different sort of mark, I guess. Um, yeah, that's correct. Does I mean, don't you like feel that on your stylus? It's not very subtle. You know, the tooth on a metal point ground, you can increase it so it's more abrasive, but don't think like an 80 grit sandpaper. Tooth mm -hmm. in a metal point drawing is almost always on the microscopic level. But even on a microscopic level, you can make changes to the amount of tooth, the hardness, as I said, the Mohs hardness of the material. But it is happening on a microscopic level. And, I see. you know, yeah, and, but you know, anybody who works for a long time in a medium, you start to feel these things, things that to a newcomer, or you just can't feel it, but you develop a feeling sure. for that slight difference in the surface. Yeah, no, I mean, I was asking because like when you were like, oh yeah, I put silica on the thing and I was like, that sounded like, oh, like, you know, when somebody uh, scratches the the blackboard? Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. oh, <laughs> like immediately, <laughs> because like, because I mean, you know, I like a some degree of tooth on the paper and everything and I love making yeah. it smooth and all this stuff, but I have just a handful of times tried using a drawing tablet for digital drawing and I yeah, yeah. do not like how that feels. I don't like how because. the Huh? What? Why why not? Why don't you like it? Because the point the plastic mm -hmm. point of the stylus on the plastic surface of the tablet it I don't mm -hmm. like how it feels. It is very yeah, very yeah, yeah. smooth and like in appearance also and I don't know if it's a matter of of, uh, of a sinking the the stylus with the tablet, the the marker on the tablet of what is supposed to be my mark lags a little bit. So like there's this combination of stuff, but I do oh, not yeah. like I don't like how it feels on my hand. I mean I like it's not you know the amount of friction is not that different different between the tablet with the stylus versus the paper with the pencil. But it, it is it's like like you were saying I guess you know I can feel it. It's different, you know and it. I don't, and I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so I guess, yeah. I guess, just thinking, because I mean, of course, I've drawn, I've drawn on other surfaces. I have occasionally drawn on a wall, and okay, and you know, I have drawn on really toothy papers, and I don't care for it because that is too much. So then, when you were yeah. like, I put silica on the thing, I was like, wow, that must be like drawing on sand. <laughs> so it sounded terrible to me. <laughs> That's but funny. it's not. Just to be clear, because yeah, yeah. the particle size is so small. Yeah. That a metal point ground actually can be incredibly smooth. It can almost right. feel like an ivory can if you keep. It depends like on the what? hardness. Like of a the what? Ground. It depends on the hardness. It's not just tooth, it's hardness. Right. So the harder the material, you know, the more you braid it. But I say even a very toothy metal point ground can still be quite smooth because we're speaking in terms of microscopic particles. 
Right. Okay. So then, okay. So then also this silica stuff or the, you know, the different kind of treatment of the ground, you have mm -hmm. to do it before any drawing happens. Or can you like start a drawing and then you're like, I want this part to be darker. Then you treat it with that silica or whatever. And then you draw more there or? How you got it. Work? You got it. Oh. And this, but this isn't, I would say a very traditional practice. It's something I'm pushing, but you're right. You know, people play with the ground, how hard they want it to be, how much tooth they want in it depending on the materials. I mean, not all metal point artists, some just dive in with their drawing paper and go for it. But you have this class of us who are kind of crafty scientists sort, and we like to play with the ingredients. So you can get that from the start and work on your drawing and that's that and you don't change it. But you're exactly right. I like to push this option of applying these hard abrasive particles on top of a drawing, midway through the drawing to reinstate the abrasion so you can start to layer the metal again. But it's a tricky thing to do. You either have to use white particles and we're back to this idea of putting a so-called scumble over the drawing and then you lose some of your darks and you have to restate them and you're back to layering. Or you could take a transparent matte medium. Golden uh, Paint Company makes several transparent matte mediums and mix in a transparent filler and then reinstate abrasion and then you are not putting the scumble on top, you're just reinstating abrasion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But to do that right, to get the ratio of, you know, filler correct, and I mean, it's a little tricky and not everybody wants to do it. You know, you are putting a layer of plastic at that point on the drawing, but then you get to keep drawing because there's that percentage of a filler in it that abrades, reinstates abrasion. So it's fun. It's a fun yeah, game. Yeah. And the, I suppose the transparent medium that you were talking about just now wouldn't add the scumbling that you were talking about, right? right. Correct. Oh. Yeah, there are ways to apply reinstate abrasion on a metal point drawing with a transparent medium, so you are not getting that scumble effect. I sometimes like the scumble effect because, as sure. I say, it kind of softens and unifies the drawing. But then you have to reinstate your darks, mm -hmm. so you're back mm -hmm. to having to build up your darks. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You know, this may uh, the whole. I mean, you know, may egg, egg tempera too, but partic I, I don't know particularly the metal point that we're talking about really reminds me a lot of uh, lithography uh which i don't yeah. ha i don't have that much experience with but it's like but especially if you're using um the the limestones it's like it's very um you know like step driven kind of like specific yeah. step driven and then yeah. you have like the uh, I don't, and, and and but but also like if you know a lot about the medium then you can start getting then you can start kind of taking some kind of liberties and kind of pushing it in a way uh, like you Correct. like you were saying because um i have a, a classmate who's a really he he loves his lithography and it's like he is like super you know he's very knowledgeable so he does all kinds of stuff like uh the all the uh, all the color gradients and colored ink and like these amazing drawings and stuff and he he really he really knows how to have fun with it and how to play with it you know like like you're saying yeah. and um but then still within kind of like these specific steps that one must take in order for the thing to look right you know okay yeah okay all right that's really cool okay so um mrs shadler what is art in your opinion well at this point uh you know boy this is a huge question of course uh the world cultures people we've become so individuated and individualized that i don't think there is well, a general question, I think art can be what anybody wants it to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's creating, it's creative. I think it's very hard once you start stretching the boundaries of the traditional mediums, and then you start getting non-traditional mediums, and then you start working, let's say, with natural objects. I mean, how do you find that line that you cut off at this point? I don't think you can. And I think, you know, I'm very loyal because I'm in love with them with traditional mediums and traditional imagery. And people are, my students are sometimes surprised how open I am to every kind of non-traditional way of working um, up to very conceptual kind of art. But I just think that's where we are at this point in the world that everybody has so individuated out of uh, a shared culture and you know shared art traditions and that I think it could be almost anything. Now, for me, traditional art, I think the role of it was to elevate the human being through 
um, a traditional visual language, you know, and we'll get to this with your second question, um, that was a beautiful language. Uh, it was about creating a certain order versus chaos. You know, it's a relationship between light and dark and warm and cool and color versus neutral neutrality and flat shapes versus volumetric shapes and, you know, abstract visuals versus content. It was kind of like this play of all these opposite elements, visual elements, and getting them into an organized, balanced relationship, not too dull, not too chaotic. And so that to me is traditional art and that's what I love. Um, but, and I think the goal was to create beauty and something that elevated the human be being. And I think you'd have a hard case to make to look through the traditional masterpieces of Western art or even non-Western art prior to the mid to late 1800s and find an image that really um, degrades or speaks about the impossibility of being a human being or the hopelessness of being a human being or the meaninglessness of being a human being. Traditional art was about finding the meaning in being a human being. And, and so that's what I love and that's what my definition of art is, but we're no longer in the place where we can impose that on everybody. People get to make and be creative however they want at this point in human history, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna like it all, but a lot of people find what I do, you know, terribly old fashioned and so, um, yeah, I, I, I think people have that freedom and right to make any kind of art they want. But, you know, of course there's a lot of it, I think is <laughs> frankly very depressing and oppressive and negative. And I think, you know, when we make images and we put them in the world, they affect human beings. Mm -hmm. And my personal take is we have a responsibility for the images we put in the world and how they affect other people. And I think a lot of the imagery people put in the world now is very um, negative, you know, says all of life is pointless and meaningless and, and humans are horrible. And, uh, it, you know, and I just, I don't think that helps where we are right now, but do I think they have the complete right to do it? Yeah, because I'm not the person who gets to say what art is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, I mean, is there any problem? Aren't there, do you think there's any problems with that uh, whole thing about uh, anything can be art or, you know, people, if you want, people want to make just trash and put it in MoMA, they can, that's okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, aren't there any, do you think there's any problems with that? I mean, do you have any arguments against it? Yeah, I do. And um, the reason this is, I'm being kind of hesitant, it's a very complicated, involved subject. I'm, you know, I'm very interested in philosophy and, um, and I think there's something to the idea that there's an evolution of human consciousness, not just a biologic, biological evolution of human beings, but the evolution of how we think. And I think, now this is, gets very complicated, and so I can get into trouble in an interview where I need four hours to talk about this, but I have only a few minutes. But I mean, traditionally humans lived within structures that helped them, that guided them to live, but made them less individual. Now, be careful with this analogy, but they were more like bees in a beehive, mm -hmm. where traditional cultures you didn't have to make the decision of who I'm going to be, what, what job am I going to do, what family do I create, my own family, my family of birth, uh, you know, uh, what gender am I going to be, you know, it's just like, we have so many choices right now as human beings. And I think that reflects our evolution from a time when humans were guided by, you know, cultural norms, expectations and art. I mean, Botticelli just could never, for a multitude of reasons, ever painted like, um, you know, Kandinsky or, uh, you know, Lucian Freud. He just couldn't. They didn't have those freedoms that we have. 
And the great thing about that is that it kept society more organized. There were, uh, you know, you were in a culture and it usually the religion and the religious values guided you. And of course, humans made endless mistakes, but we had a, a context in which to live. And we don't anymore. We have freedom and we have individual freedom. And that's mm -hmm. a wonderful thing. I want my individual freedom. Much as I love the Renaissance painting, I don't, I don't want that kind of limitation that they had, even though those structures mean that you ended up with Botticelli paintings instead of some of the awful imagery we see nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. But it puts a lot of responsibility on us as individuals because we have so much freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think it's about making choices and no longer being guided by a cultural construct in which you live in but you know you have to make these choices and as i said not everybody's going to agree with me but you know images go out in the world and they affect people they really affect people whether those images are on tv or movies or commercials so moving images or whether it's visual arts um graphic arts uh, advertising you name it those images go in the world and they affect us as human beings and what is the project of a human being right now? What are we trying to do? Um, you know, I just don't think, again, it's tricky and it's a more complex conversation that we get into, but I, I don't want to be part of contributing to a world, a, a message that life is awful all the time. It's impossible. It's depressing. Humans are meaningless. They're nothing but, you know, destructive, awful creatures. You know, we definitely have a lot of problems, of course, but humans are also remarkable. You know, Van Eyck, the, you know, the um, Ghent altarpiece. Mm -hmm. My God, that is a remarkable creation by a human being. Um, so humans are capable of remarkable things as well. And, you know, so do I think there's consequences to putting out kind of artwork that is very, I mean, I see these weird paintings where they show humans all cut apart and bleeding, or they show humans who are these kind of monstrous constructions of a lot of different parts and animals and cut limbs. And I just, you know, I just don't, or, or there's people who are painting in, you know, traditional ways, both the materials and the visuals and this hardcore pornography. I mean, talking about John Curran, of course. And, um, you know, they're free to do that. And I, we have, but I think we should take responsibilities for the images we put in the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm a limited person. I'm a limited artist. I'm not a great Van Eyck painter by any stretch of the imagination. And even John Curran, whose work, I mean, he's a brilliant painter. Um, Lucian Freud is a brilliant painter. You know, now who's the one I'm thinking of? I'm spacing out. Oh, th I'm going to get in trouble for this one. <laughs> but... Odd Nerdrum, is he an incredible painter? Oh my God, he's an amazing painter. But these images, you know, of, uh, you know, humans shitting by, excuse my French, you know, he has these paintings of people going to the bathroom by water. I know his point, degradation, the humans, the awful things we do, but he also puts a lot of disturbing imagery in the world. And I think people should be best they can understand that their images affect where we're all going and how we're all feeling about each, ourselves and each other. So, I mean, this is, you know, as I say, I can get in oodles of trouble <laughs> for this. I actually love the stage of where humans are. I love this choice we have, this freedom we have. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to be responsible to the extent I'm capable of how I affect other human beings. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I don't think freedom, I don't think there's necessarily, um, like, <sighs> all right, so I listened to part of the conversation between, uh, Lex Friedman and I mean I, I, do you know that podcast it's pretty popular it's a Lex Friedman podcast and he talked with Tucker Carlson and I listened to it for like I don't know a little while 
Um, yep. Just, I mean, I've never watched the news, <laughs> but I was like, I, everyone hates this guy. I wonder what he's like. So uh, I listened Good, to it. Interested. Yeah, yeah, because it's like, I, I want to hear things from the horse's mouth. It's like, I do not trust the yeah, news. Absolutely. Um, anyway, so, I mean, he seemed fine. Uh, and he was mm-hmm. like, he was talking about how, who was it? He was like, he said John Stewart was talking about how, yeah, New York is a shithole and Los Angeles is a shithole, but that is the price that you pay for freedom. Or something, mm-hmm. and then Tucker Car- Tucker Carlson was like, "You can have a beautiful city and have freedom as well." It's like there is, it's like, um, it, I mean, so like John Stewart. I mean, according to him, because I like I didn't go listen to John Stewart. I, you know, mm-hmm. I just I left it there. I was like, I mean, I agree with him, uh, and then that's it. I don't care that much <laughs> about either one of those people. But the thing is right. that, but the but the thing is that. Um, I mean, I agree with that. It's like, you don't have to live in a pigsty to be free. Uh, you know, Correct. Uh, you know, so Correct. like, so like, I guess what I'm trying to get, I mean, so I don't know, I, I would, I personally would prefer if there was some kind of a balance and some kind of a, a little bit more mature sort of view of stuff in the sense Correct. that um, unfettered freedom doesn't mean that we, that I mean, th- that doesn't mean that there's no order. That doesn't mean that there is no right and wrong. That doesn't mean that Absolutely. shit is. It, that doesn't mean that like crap gets to be called art, you know. For right. example, like, like that's um, and and I mean that's in part, large part the reason for which I started the podcast because, the. The this relationship between stuff that is actually art versus things that is not art stopped. It's like I was like I don't I, I don't want to yeah. deal with this anymore. Because it doesn't make any yeah. sense to me. It's like, yeah. it's like no, the break on the pedestal in MoMA is not art. And I don't have to be okay with that. And it's like, I, uh, so, you know, like, I, I want to kind of, like, find that more solid um, based in just centuries <laughs> of right. knowledge, uh, idea of art. And it's like... And it's like, and it's like at the same time, like, all of the rules and whatever it is from, you know, the salons and the Royal Academy and whatever you want, um, it, you know, the, the rules themselves are not like an, or, you know, for me, you know, and so you can tell me what you think about this. They're not mm-hmm. a, ne- they, they, they don't, they don't negate freedom. Um, and neither does, because that's what I was thinking of when you were talking about freedom and then having to put up with these just bullshit images. Um, it's like, it, like religion in a way, like religion doesn't necessarily steamroll everyone into being the same thing what it does what yeah no i agree i agree yeah yeah i mean so like what it does and i know this i know this in or you know not know this i learned this from jordan peterson's biblical lectures which i'm not done with but i am i'm enjoying them greatly where he talks about the stories in the bible as uh in from a psychological point of view and his kind of conclusion is that they're more like a guide for how to not have a shit life, basically. And it's like, and it's like, uh, I think it's kind of like an incredible human achievement that never fails to give me goosebumps that we were able to put that information together for the coming mm-hmm. generation. So it's like, so you can have the view of religion of, uh, what's his name? Dawkins, um, where you think who, that people who believe in God have some kind of problem in their mind, which is an asshole opinion, by the way. Um, or you can be like, you know, there might be some value in the story. Like, I don't have to pray or anything, but it's like, don't be a resentful piece of shit and then murder your brother. That sounds like a good lesson, no matter what you believe in. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, I would like it if there was some kind of a balance between kind of like just understanding the rules and then kind of earning your freedom in a way. And then that way you don't end up putting trash images in MoMA, you know? Because it's like, yeah. for example, for you, like you have all of this experience with both the egg tempera and the metal point, And it's like, you learned how the thing works and now you can play with it. You see right. what I'm saying? So it's like, um, I do. tell me what you think about that. Well, you know, Peterson talks a lot about order versus chaos. Right. And I think that is one of our tasks as human beings is to find that balance between order and chaos. Because chaos isn't great everything falls apart and order is tyrannical right so we and and the same thing is happening in great painting that is the primary thing that's been achieved in the old master painting is they start with a visual language that's derived 
ultimately from the natural world. It's embedded in the natural world. You could get into a case, is that embedded, this, this incredible visual language of light, dark, warm, cool, flatness, volume, single source light. If you study what single source full spectrum light does to a sphere in terms of transitions and values, chroma, temperature, it's, a, it's incredible, it's, our, it's so artistic. So this artistic language embedded in the natural world that we get to learn and study and then recreate in the painting is that biologically created or is it divinely created? I'm not gonna get into that discussion. I could believe me, because I love these discussions. But suffice to say that you're right, that I, that I think that one of our tasks here is to find that line between order and chaos. But we've reached a point in history where we used to have cultural guidelines and we didn't have to think so much about finding that line because the cultural guidelines found us for found them for us so we didn't have this freedom to make the choices we now are being increasingly asked to choose which this balance between order and chaos and here's the way i you know i didn't invent this idea but there's a great philosopher i don't know if you've read any of owen barfield mm -mm. he's a very he's not a well-known philosopher there was a group um in the early 20th century called the Inklings. Many people know of them. It was C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and Owen Barfield. They all went to, I can't remember whether it was Oxford or Cambridge, but anyhow, and they all went in as atheists and they all came out as believers, although <laughs> Lewis became an Anglican and Tolkien of the Lord of the Rings, he became right. a Catholic and Owen Barfield became an anthroposophist. And Owen Barfield, uh, uh, Lewis called him the greatest of all my teachers. So even though Lewis and Tolkien are very well known, Barfield is not well known, but he's the most, I think, brilliant of them. And he just wasn't quite the writer they were. He's a very hard writer to read. But, um, you know, if, if anybody out there is interested in the subject and wants to start with Barfield, man, he is tough. But I would recommend a book called The Rediscovery of Meaning, which is a collection of short essays. Um, and one of the things he proposes, and it's not his theory, it's, it's also, it's being proposed by a lot of people, as I said earlier in our conversation, is there's not only an evolution of biology going on, there's an evolution of consciousness. And the way to think about it is we started out kind of like, an, you know, there's always the macro in the micro. And we kind of started out like an infant in a family where the infant isn't thinking for themselves, the family is organizing and telling him what to do and what their values are and how to live. And that's how kind of early humans were. They were in these structures that told them how to live. And increasingly, a child who's raised in a healthy family is given more and more choices and responsibilities, so they're not always dependent on the structure of the family. And they come to this point, the danger years, <laughs> teenager, where suddenly they're given a lot of responsibility. They get to drive a car and go out later at night. And, and this is the more responsibility you have the more you have to choose this balance between order and chaos and make those decisions yourself to grow into a healthy human being. And a lot of people and who study this idea of the evolution of consciousness believe we're kind of in a teenage stage where we have incredible freedom compared to early people on all levels, our values, our lifestyle choices, our cultural choices. We are swimming in choice and like a teenager and it's it's hard to make the right choice sometimes because you have to find that balance between order and chaos and i think the reason old master painting appeals to so many people is because that's what it does it finds a balance between order and chaos using this tremendous visual language drawn from the natural world and when that balance is found not only between the visual language of light, dark, warm, cool, chroma versus neutrality, flatness versus volume, all these visual elements, but between abstract visual language put into relationship, but also content, meaning, like the Ghent altar piece. Then when you get all that together, that's kind of what our job is as human beings reflected on a two-dimensional surface, is to bring all the complex elements into a balanced, some relationship not too orderly and not too chaotic and there's beauty so that's that's my thinking on it but you know if you really somebody's really interested in this again I would recommend 
that rediscovery of meaning by Owen Barfield um, or his smaller uh, books of essays. I'm, I'm spacing out, but don't, don't start with um, uh, his hardest book, which I'm spacing out on, um, but uh, what's it called? Um, oh, anyhow, it's, it's his most famous book. You'll, you'll see it referred to, and I'll think of it in a second, but start with, I think, as I say, the easiest entry is uh, The Rediscovery of Meaning or another book of essays called History, Guilt, and Habit. And so, but you know, it's just my thing. Not everybody's gonna agree with it. That's fine. Okay. All right. Um, so Mrs. Shadler, what is beauty in your opinion? What is beauty? Again, same thing I say about art. It can be, it's an individual choice at this point. I can't tell anybody what to think. But for me, beauty originates in the natural world. I don't think you're going to find many people on the planet who don't think that the most beautiful things they've seen are generally either on a micro level when you look at some plant under a microscope and see where they're or on the macro level when you're looking at the cosmos and then everything in between that's where the greatest beauty lie lies so I think it's found in the natural world and it's based on this incredible visual language as I say of if you want to dissect it, which you can't because it's such a complex puzzle, it's very hard to pull one piece out uh, of it because they're all in relationship to each other. But I would say that it's a, a relationship, not too chaotic, not too ordered between these visual elements of light, dark, warm, cool, the things I've said multiple times. Um, and when you take all these pieces of the visual language and put them into that harmonious relationship, the world as well. And it's, you know, it's what I say to students, you're building an ecosystem. It's a visual ecosystem. And it's very hard to do because all you need to do is throw in one butterfly too many and the frog population goes nuts. Or, you know, we all know how hard it is to recreate a natural ecosystem because the relationships are so perfectly balanced. And in a painting, you're trying to create these relationship between all these pieces of the visual language, as well as between the abstract visuals and the content you're trying to express. So it's very hard to find that perfect point where everything is in just the right relationship to each other, not too chaotic and not too organized. So, but that's what I think beauty is. And um, yeah, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> all I have to do, as I say, is, you know, do I wanna live with, um, you know, again, so I don't even want to get into some of these horrible, horrible images online of mutilation and everything. Or do I want to live with the Ghent altarpiece, you know, or, you know, there's so many I could name. These are just, you know, Eric, um, what's his name? He climbed the Don Wall. I'm speaking as Eric, can't think of his last name. But anyhow, he recently climbed uh, this wall in Yosemite. Actually, it was El Capitan. He free soloed it. Anybody who hasn't watched the movie that shows how he did this, it's impossible what he did. It's absolutely impossible that this kid climbed this, I forget how big, 3,000 foot wall with no ropes and no nothing. It, you know, something that used to took days and days to accomplish with ropes and he did it free solo in like a few hours or something. It's insane. But that's the same thing happened when the Ghent altarpiece was painted. You could not get a human being on the planet right now to paint such a perfect organization of the visual language, the content of that painting, the, uh, the spiritual content, um, the story. I mean, these are achievements. Humans could do unbelievable things, but they're very, very hard to do. So um, I'm getting a little off track from your question, but I'll simplify your, you know, the answer. What is beauty? It's the Ghent altarpiece. You know, that's mm -hmm. beauty to me. Or it's some of Rembrandt's self-portraits. Or, you know, I could go on and on. There's so many incredible paintings um, in traditional Western art that I think meet the definition of beauty. Mm -hmm. Don't you think there's a contradiction between saying that um, beauty can be anything and then and then saying that everyone can see beauty, can find some kind, can find beauty in nature. Yeah, this is a great question. You asked good questions, uh, again, but very complicated answers. So, 
I think everybody, in a way, you know, people really resist this idea that there's a standard of beauty, a definition of beauty, mm -hmm. and that it's, we're back to this talk, that beauty has been brought down to an individual level. And everybody gets to say on an individual level what beauty is. And that's the time we live in. And I think it's true in a way. Um, but I, I feel also, but I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> okay. um, I think we do have, I, I don't, you know, Barfield's book, The Rediscovery of Meaning. I think the universe and all of the natural world and humans in particular are completely meaningful in every way. And so I think humans, to the extent they deny traditional beauty it's um it's the mind you know the, th the great thing about having a mind like we have is we can justify anything anything good or anything bad that's what the mind does the mind is amoral it can do anything and you know we know that from history so we have to be careful of the mind because if our higher self isn't in charge of the mind the mind can justify anything mm -hmm. you know from the worst atrocities to, you know, great things. So I think to the extent that humans deny beauty, the kind of beauty I've tried to describe inadequately, but have tried, to the extent humans deny that, I think that is more of a, a mental construct and not their higher self speaking. You know, we know that when we go to the grocery store and we hand a $20 bill to the person and they give us you know, too much change. There's a part of us that, you know, wants it. <laughs> and the mind can justify, oh, she's a nasty cashier. Oh, I'm broke today. Oh, I've been right. waiting so long. The mind can somehow justify it. And there's this little tiny grab deep inside of us says, no, it's, it's not my money. She made a mistake. She's human. And so I think just as we have that kind of moral compass within us, I think we have an artistic and a beauty compass within us. And if you want to work in a traditional way, you have to really learn to listen to that compass and silence the mind. Because I say the mind can justify anything. You know, I have students, they're working on a piece and there's a part of a corner of a painting they don't understand. And they sit there, well, it kind of makes the painting interesting. When everybody says that, I know yeah. we're in trouble. Because they're trying, the mind's trying to talk them out of solving the problem. So, but the inside, there's this little tug on them that knows I'll say, a student would say, my painting's not working. And I'll say, what part? I don't know, I don't know. And I push and I push. 100% of the time, they know exactly mm. what part yeah, isn't working. Yeah. But they don't want to acknowledge it, and the mind just talked them out of it. I'm not saying the mind's bad. I'm just saying we have to be in charge of it. Right. And that's, again, back to this evolution of consciousness, this is what we're increasingly learning to do on the, the micro scale as kids grow up into teenagers and trying to learn not to listen to those impulses. I mean, you have to honor them to some degree, but you want the higher self to be in charge of your life mm -hmm. or you get into a lot of trouble. You cause a lot of pain to yourself and to others. And so I believe that analogy is the same in painting, that you have to learn to listen to this higher self that kind of goes beyond reason sometimes, and it takes practice to listen to it the higher self that knows damn well that the woman at the cashier made a mistake and you owe her the money mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you don't try to justify it. So I think humans have that capacity to develop that sense. And if they do, I think you increasingly fine tune your feeling for the beauty in the world and what beauty is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I'm not gonna rob anybody of any process or try to impose, I'm just gonna do my part my very, 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 very small, modest part, you know, so. Mm -hmm. um, okay. The, um, I was reminded of something just now, just give me a second. Sure. Um, Okay, I mean, yeah, like the um, the instinct of beauty, basically. Um, I've been reading... Well, let me just quickly interrupt you. Yes. I would say it's the intuition of beauty. 
right. rather than the instinct. Uh, not to nitpick words, but um, I think instinct uh, refers more to uh, biological needs, yeah. which we should honor. I mean, we want to survive biologically. Uh, but I think intuition refers more to that higher voice, that higher self. Mm -hmm. So that would be my fine tuning. Okay, I mean, I use the term instinct deliberately. Um, mm -hmm. Dennis Dutton has a book called The Art Instinct. The mm -hmm. art, the art instinct. Um, and I'm not done reading it. But, he, I mean, his argument is basically that both the, des the desire to make art and the understanding of beauty are both biological. Mm -hmm. And part of our survival. And, like, again, I'm not done with the book. But I right. really, I'm like um, a third of the way through, I think. And I really like all of his arguments. Uh, the mm -hmm. arguments that he's making in favor of that. And I, uh, the reason for which I bring that up is because I think that's the reason for which a quote-unquote layperson sees trash work. Mm -hmm. And is like, my five-year-old can do that. Or that's not art. And then the person Correct. who made the trash work is like, you don't understand art. Because they that's made... Mine. Right, so then, so then, so then, what I'm trying to say with that is that the lay person, quote unquote, is correct because, and I mean, I agree that it's an intuition as well. You know, it it can be both, um, in the sense that you know, like your gut will tell you, like that doesn't seem right, um, and you know, you might not be able to explain why or whatever. But the thing is that I think that because our our teacher is nature. In the sense that, I mean, she like you know she doesn't have to try to teach us anything because we can see it with our eyeballs. We can see the proportions mm -hmm. of other people. We can see the proportions of animals. We can see the proportions of a landscape. Exactly. We can see that we can see that we see it all the time since we were born with your eyes, and we can. It's like for music, oh, we have the sounds and all of this stuff, whatever. Mm -hmm. So then that information is the information that we can use to determine whether something is proportioned or correct, correct. in its appearance. So then. So then I think, um, for me, it makes sense for that to lead me kind of into both art and beauty having universal standards. Mm -hmm. Be so, so, then, so then it's like, I mean, you know, yes, everyone is an individual, but we're not that different that there is a complete disconnect between one, between one person and another or a group of, group of people and another in what is when something is well made, when something is balanced and proportionate and looks right, as you know, Roger mm -hmm. Roger Scruton would right. say, something looks right. Um, right, right. That's right. So correct. yeah. So well, and by saying the individual all the time, I don't mean to say that there aren't these universal truths. I actually believe there are. I just mean that we are at the point in history where individually we have to choose that, as opposed to it being given by the culture. It's an individual choice, but I, I agree that there are these universal truths. And I, you know, I, this gets, again, you ask great questions and it gets down to a very complicated discussion, but I'll, you know, and I don't care showing my cards. I, I'm happily show my cards, but you know, the book you're describing, it sounds to me like it's a materialistic philosophy of the world and that the world is, you know, primarily matter and that's it. And I don't feel that way. I feel like the world is a combination of matter and spirit and spirit is sure. manifesting matter. Okay. I and mean, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, go. it's just so I think that to say we, we live in a time where we attribute almost all our impulses to biology and the biological impulses for sure are incredibly strong. But if that's all we are, and if there are no higher impulses, then this is how we get into trouble. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think um, I'm kind of trying to like cleanse myself from that view because I, I mean, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. That, and, and it makes me think of like this divide between kind of like rational or, and sentimental versus the mind and the body, for example. Yeah. Um, and um, I think those ideas are just so painfully detrimental and they have caused so much fucking trouble um and i i just you know descartes was wrong there is no divide between the mind and body and it's like this it's being so so then it's like i guess when 
when I'm saying that's when when I'm reading um Dennis Dutton's book yeah um I'm just um I just don't see that divide between biology and what you you know if you want to like psychology or the spirit or whatever um I don't think there's a separation between the two I think they're both together and one or you know like the mind and the body the mind and the body are not separate they are the same it's like it's in your brain and it's in your just your body your your body and the brain are the same thing they're one and and like the whole psychological aspect your personality and all of this stuff it's like in your brain it has like its own physicality or something you know like i was listening to this lady whose name i don't remember but she had a crazy south african accent um she was Love talking uh, what I love the South African accent. <laughs> yeah, it was like, anyway, the thing is that she was talking about how thoughts are physical in the sense that they have a physical shape in your brain. And he, she had like a model of it. It was like this tree with branches and stuff. It was like a tree in winter or something, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's fucking crazy and awesome. And it's like, <laughs> I love these things that, because, okay, so kind of so to, ta to talk about something that it's maybe more related to art a little bit, maybe. You know, when, when, when we get, when I was taught artistic anatomy, you know, you get taught the, the skeletal system, you get taught the muscular system, you know, and then the skin on top of those two. And it's like, yeah, separating things that way is a way, one way to study something, to learn about something. But that doesn't mean that is how the thing is. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So it's like, so it's like, if you're talking about studying, I mean, because it's like, if you look at like the bony landmarks, it's like, yeah, yeah, but there is still tendon and fat and skin on top of that. It is not just bone. Like it isn't bone with like a piece of fabric that is a skin draped over. That's not how that is. It's like, that's like an right. analogy or a metaphor or whatever. But then one has to remember that that is not actually how it is. And it's, it's a unit that makes yeah, up the solid thing that, that one sees. So then it's like, just kind of like this, more analogies for how uh physical and um anyway well I, I mean i agree with all you're saying except i have a slightly different viewpoint you know i think we've reached a stage where so we have the biological it's very real it's very important it's very beautiful we have to attend to it but that higher self i'm talking about you know i think using the word spirit is hard for people to use most people want to say energy um but i prefer to call it spirit and i think the mind is the intermediary between those two and we're trying to find that balance between a relationship to our biological self that we need to attend to but also that relationship to you know the the invisible spiritual organizing principles that are embedded in the world in which make manifest you know, the natural world and our own marvelous, incredible anatomy. So I think behind that all, there is an animating force that I, you know, I call spirit. And I think it's intelligent and, um, you know, meaningful. And so I think the mind isn't the same thing. I don't think psychology is the same thing. I think it's outside of us as well as within us organizing us. But so that's just a slight distinction I would made, but you know, I didn't write a book on it and I'm sure his book is really interesting, but I tend to think people, myself included, underestimate how materialistically we see the world, uh, this materialistic philosophy that everything ultimately is matter and dependent on uh, materialistic impulses. And I, you know, I think that's why we're in so much trouble right now because we are not acknowledging the spiritual um, intelligent forces that brought all this into being to begin with um, and are behind it all. And it's not our mind. It's, it's, you know, it's more than that. So, but anyhow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, Mrs. Shadler, we have broken the one hour mark of our conversation today. So I'm going to start right. to close it out. Um, why don't you tell our listeners and viewers, uh, you know, you want to add anything, where can people find your work? Do you have any projects coming up? Uh, anything you want to plug anything you're excited about um my work can be found you know you can enter my name uh Koo shadler it's also my website www.kushadler.com and now i'm entering a really interesting phase in my life i'm not going to plug anything per se you know i spent I, I as i said i became a painter 
kind of late in my 30s. Um, I'm in my early 60s now, and I spent most of my career plugging myself and, you know, being an editor at the Artist Magazine, and I had some museum shows, and I've been teaching um, for 20 plus years and traveled all over the world to teach. And I just feel like I've reached the stage where I just want to be alone in the studio doing whatever the heck I want and being really led by source to create whatever it is. Because even though I have had a relatively original career in that I've dove so deeply into egg tempera, um, as I said, I've taught it. I didn't mention I've also written a 300 page book on egg tempera um, available on Amazon. Um, you know, and so I've, at the same time, you know, my career has been kind of shaped by the external forces of the gallery world and getting attention. And I'm, I'm, all, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. I don't care anymore. So uh, I'm just going to go in my studio. Um, I'm building a new studio and um, I'm not going to have a teaching space as my current one does. And I'll maybe I'll teach periodically, but I'm just going to do my own thing and see where it takes me. OK. All right. Well, that sounds great. It does. I Good, agree. Great retirement plan. Yeah. Okay. Sort of, sort of retirement, sort of finally doing what I want. Yes. So. Well, um, thank you, Koo, very much uh, for talking with me today. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you want to support Koo and my podcast, you can do so through the links in the video description. So please check them out. So uh, that's going to be it for now, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Bye.